Okay, now I want to take us into a little more sophisticated. It's going to be a little bit um, more challenging to finish up the sequence of videos, but I want to get to the punchline about 5040 specifically. We've got this finite list of numbers that are both superior highlight composite and colossally abundant, and we've gotten that by comparing uh, the d of n function and the sigma of n function to a pretty crude approximation, namely n to some power. And if we're more uh, subtle about it, we can actually pin down better, at least for sigma of n. So let me do it for d of n first, but then we'll see that sigma of n has a better result associated with it. And a lot of this stuff I'm not going to be able to prove for you. In fact, I don't really know how to prove it. I'd have to study for a year probably to prove it. Um, so the, the key is more state, precise statements about asymptotic behavior, the long, the big n behavior, the long run behavior of d sub n, d of n, and sigma of n. Okay, so. Here's one way of saying uh, this result, the d of n grows slower than, than powers. So for example, it grows slower than the one half power. So there's some constant c, maybe it has to be rather large, um, so the d of n is less than c times root n. Um, so eventually, or in other words, you know, for, for, for big n, we don't really care about small n too much, um, we've got, we just take the log of both sides. So ln of d of n is using rules of logarithms, the log of c, just a constant, plus one half times log n using the it's ln of n to the one half. Well, eventually the one half log n, log n is growing, not super fast, but it's going to swamp whatever this constant is. So we just maybe take 0.5 and add a tiny bit to it. It's going to be less than, let's say, 0.51 ln n. Now 0.51 isn't particularly important what the detail is. Okay. So um, so the log of d of n, if we look measure it logarithmically, it's growing slower than a certain constant times log n. But this constant really came from the, the, the power here, the, the one half power that was in the root. Okay, so similarly, um, we could also say we might need to choose a, a rather bigger constant, but uh, the theorem says that d of n is also less than some other constant times n to the point one power. It grows slower than that eventually. So take the log of both sides. So now the log of d of n is uh, growing slower than point one one ln n. Okay, so the, the key thing is that if this is true for every power, what this means is that if we compare ln of d of n to ln n, in other words, if we take the ratio ln d of n over ln of n, okay, it's always going to go to zero. It's going to fade out. Okay. Um, so what if we compared it to something that grows just slightly slower than ln of n? Turns out, if you take ln of n, that's slow growing but we want it to actually even slow it down even a little bit, um, we're going to divide it by ln of ln of n. One note, uh, I'm using ln to be clear here. If you look at the literature, you know, when number theorists use log, they almost always mean uh, the natural log. So if you'll see in, in the references and even on Wikipedia, um, it'll be using log, but they really mean the natural log. Okay, So that's just trying to motivate the idea, uh, this theorem of uh, Vigert that I'm going to say next. Um, turns out to be a good idea to compare the ln of d of n to this particular function. So here's the statement. Um, the lim soup, and you don't have to know what that is, although it will help, um, but I'm going to explain it. Uh, as n goes to infinity, of the ln of d of n divided by ln of n over ln of ln of n turns out to be a number, a fixed number. And this is kind of a nice place to be. Ooh, that's a very particular number. It's not some arbitrary number greater than zero, or some number that's you know hard to pin down or not a constant. The claim is that we're really approaching a constant in some sense. Now, the lim soup, though, I have to explain what that means. So we've got this rather complicated measure of how many divisors a number has. We started with d of n. We took its logarithm. We compared it to ln of n, but that didn't quite work because if we do that and n gets large, it's just always going to go to zero. And it's not that interesting. It's not very quantitative. It's like, yeah, duh. It just says that d of n grows smaller than any power. But if we just tweak the ln a little bit, then we get an actual number, a magic number, ln2. So what does it mean to say the limb soup is equal to ln2? I'm not saying that the limit is equal to that, and it's a more subtle statement. Here's what it means. Here's a very sketchy picture I, I put together here. So we graph this weird measure um, ln d sub n over ln of n, etc., as a function of n. And here's the straight line ln2 as this dashed line. What it says is that roughly we're going to get a bunch of up and down oscillation. We know that this graph goes all the way up and down, up and down, and it's often going to have small values because for primes d of n is quite small. 
um, is 2, and then dividing by something that's growing, it's going to go to 0. Okay, so we're going to get a lot of small values, but we're also going to get some values above ln2. And the claim is, by saying this lim soup statement, here's what it says. So let me bring the text up into view with the picture. Okay. Um, it says that if I put a band around ln2, let's say L is a number just a little bit less than ln2, and M is a number that's a little bit bigger than ln2. I probably should have put the band on the original picture, but I will. Okay. It says that um, we will keep butting up from below against ln2. There will be an infinite number of n's that approach that get close to the magic number ln2 from above from below so they're in the lower part of the band between l and ln2 okay so it means that we keep going going up until that okay um, we're getting close to ln2 from below but it also means that um, with any band on the top side any m on the top side there's only a finite number of examples that get that far away from ln2. So ln2 is about 0.7. Let's say m is 0.8, for example. Let's choose 0.8. It says that eventually, well, even though these dots are bouncing up and down in a kind of crazy pattern, eventually you'll never find another one that's as badly violating the idea of being bigger than ln2 as to be bigger than 0.8. If you crank down this to 0.71 or something like that, then you might have to go further because these guys are flitting around and have and often getting above 0.71, but eventually they'll stop because there's only a finite number of examples. Okay, so it says that these guys love to be uh, near ln2, and they often come up from below, but they rarely go above. And eventually, for any given error tolerance, you can stop them from going above. Here's the problem, though, that doesn't say that eventually they stop going above at all because I had to pick this error tolerance. I had to pick this m above ln2. If you actually say, OK, are there a finite number so that this measurement is above ln2? The answer is no. It's still actually an infinite number. If this weren't true, then it would be very tempting to look at just the numbers for which this is bigger than ln2 and say, oh, those are the ones that are surprising, where d of n is surprisingly big. Because here's this magic number. And we've found a very sophisticated, precise way of measuring the trend, the long-term trend in D of n. And it's basically saying, hey, ln2 is really important here. And it's hard to get a number with this measurement above ln2. If there was only a finite number, I'd be very tempted to say, OK, hey, that's another way to say, um, here's the really, really divisible numbers. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite work. Okay, We have to pick some error tolerance, some little m, and then I get a finite number. Well, I hate it. I hate the idea of it depending on a choice of m. I want it to be not arbitrary. Okay, my list of anti primes shouldn't be arbitrary. Okay, so that's not a great way to go thing with things. Also, um, if you actually look at the real graph, this was sort of the sketchy graph where I'm trying to indicate that eventually finding stuff significantly above ln2 is really really rare. Um, here's the actual graph up to uh, about 10, you know, way past 10 million. Um, it's actually it's it's very scar scarce here because it, to improve the speed I didn't actually print every number I just print every like five thousandth number or something like that. Um, if you look at these numbers, they're actually bigger than one for quite a while. Um, and but you can still see this idea that some of them are big, but most of them are small. Um, but in fact, Wigert's uh, Wigert's prediction is that these should actually go way way down and go down to about 0.693 eventually. But we're not seeing it for small numbers. So that's another thing. Even if uh, we wanted to use some criterion like this, um, it, these numbers are not getting LN, near ln2 very, very quickly. And anytime you have a number theory thing with ln of ln, which is very, very common, remember how slowly that grows. This means that this might only take over and be significant when n is a really, really, really huge number. Because the log of the log grows very, very, very slowly. OK. so. Um, it looks like this is not um, not a great idea. Now, the nice thing is that if we look, sorry about the, the flashing up and down there. OK. For sigma, we've got actually a very nice situation. Here's the similar statement due to Grunewald. OK. The lim soup 
as n goes to infinity, of sigma of n. Well, let's see. Remember what the deal was there. If we divide it by n alone, it still grew at a moderate rate, uh, or really, actually, rather slowly. And it was sigma of n over n. If we even put in a tiny little power beyond that, um, it, it went to 0. And that was the basis of the colossally abundant numbers. So the nice thing is if we just put in this really minor modification, ln of ln of n, then we get the same kind of statement, the limb soup is equal to a magic number. Here, it's e to the gamma, which is a great thing. Maybe I'll do a video about gamma sometime. But just briefly, um, it's a well-known fact that the sum of the harmonic series, sum of 1 over k, 1 plus 1 half plus a third plus a fourth, etc., that diverges. You can't add them all up. You can't take the limit as n goes to infinity. But the way in which it diverges is almost exactly logarithmic, that this guy is very well approximated by ln of n. Well, that is just an approximation, though. It's not real. It's not exact. And what happens if you look at the difference between that and ln n? Um, it turns out that if you take the limit of that as n goes to infinity, it's actually a constant, and it's Euler's constant. It's the one that's not e. Um, and it comes up in all kinds of things, especially analytic number theory, because ln's come up all, all over the place. This is obviously something that's not too foreign for number theory. Um, it comes up all over the place. And in fact, e to this number turns, up to, turns out to come up in a lot of places, especially in the study of the primes and divisibility. So turns out e to the gamma is about 1.78. Um, and so now we've got um, a version of, of measuring how many divisors ha a number has. You add up all the divisors. You divide it by the number itself. And then you tweak that a little bit by dividing it by the log of the log of the number. That's something that you can expect to settle down towards a constant with a bunch of dips down. Remember the idea of this kind of picture, this picture or this picture. You're always going to get really small values. Because remember, there's always the primes and always things that have very few divisors. But even if you just count like the top edge of things, the claim is if you kind of look at the top envelope of one of these pictures for the sigma of n version, which I haven't graphed, sorry, um, it actually settles down to be a number. Okay, so that's so far that's just analogous to the D of n result. Um, but here's the great thing. Okay, well, so let me just explicate it one more time. It says that if I put a band around e to the gamma, l and m, two horizontal lines, means there um, there will keep being a lot of n's. There's an infinite number of n's that get very close to e to the gamma from below. It's below the edge of the lower band, but only a finite number of n's that are outside the upper band. But here's the cool thing. That, that would only take us as far as the D of n story. Um, the cool thing is that if the Riemann hypothesis holds, Ramanujan showed that you can actually erase the error, the sort of uh, margin of error on the top. Okay, um, And so that means that, in fact, there's only a finite number of n's with this measure of divisibility bigger than a certain fixed constant e to the gamma. And um, Robin, or Robin, I'm not sure, actually, in 1984, pretty recently, proved that, again, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, that the last n that actually violates that bound is none other than good old 50-40. Okay. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now, it's conditional on the Riemann hypothesis, so nobody's absolutely sure that there isn't a violator, but it's actually an, this is actually an if and only if. If we find a bigger number um, than 50-40, that is so surprisingly divisible so that this measure is bigger than the magic number, then we actually disprove the Riemann hypothesis. It would conceivably be a way to disprove the Riemann hypothesis. So let's, let's review where we're at. I'm almost done with the videos. We've got a rather sophisticated measure of how many divisors a number has. You add up the divisors, divide by n, and then fudge it with ln L, L, of ln of n. Lots of theorems, or maybe lots of computer time, shows you that it's really, really hard for this number to be bigger than 1.781. And in fact, as far as anybody knows, there's only a few numbers that actually satisfy that, and the biggest one is 50-40. Okay, so as far as sigma is concerned, or this modified version of sigma, essentially, we can say that most likely, that's assuming the Riemann hypothesis, 50-40 is the most significant antiprime, um, a number more divisible than it ought to be. This shouldn't, this really oughtn't to be bigger than e to the gamma. It's almost never true that it's big, bigger than e to the gamma. Um, it's only true for a few small finite examples, all of which are um, 
colossally abundant numbers, um, all of which are on our list that we had before, the green entries in the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and But this one is the last one. This one is the biggest one. I think that means it's more significant. We always tend to find small counterexamples to these theorems, so the biggest one is most notable. Okay, So this is the most significant antiprime in a certain sense, most likely, which is a little disappointing, except that when we say, okay, if we could ever prove that it's not the biggest one, if, in fact, some huge 27 million digit number actually again violates this inequality, then we win a million dollars because we've disproved the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, So that's the punchline, where, where I think 5040 comes in in a very cool way um, as the best of the best of the best.